On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA's risky decisions behind Artemis 1, Atlas V launched a successful test on an inflatable heat shield, and the U.S. Space Force's space plane returns to Earth after 908 days in orbit. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. It was down to the wire again for NASA's space launch system, as structural damage, rain, and hurricanes threatened to once again delay the November 16th launch of the space agency's star launch vehicle. But, in spite of it all, Artemis 1 finally burst into the night sky riding a massive plume of fire kicked out by the most powerful set of rocket engines to ever blast off from the Earth, destined for the moon. The countdown clock started running in the evening hours of November 15th, NASA making the decision to take it slow this time around with a longer startup procedure intending to help maintain stability through the fueling process and to take advantage of the near-perfect weather conditions in the still night air of the very early hours this morning. NASA going out of their way to have a slow-paced early morning launch is a sign of how much they needed the conditions to be right for this launch. They completely did away with the fanfare and the festivity that surrounded their first launch attempt back in August. NASA just wanted to get the job done this time, and they did. The Artemis 1 mission has been plagued with issues, and in the last couple of months it has been trying and very publicly failing to launch. Artemis 1 is an attempt by NASA to test the feasibility of their SLS rocket and Orion capsule by sending an uncrewed mission into orbit around the moon and returning to Earth after a thorough round of testing. A lot of time has been spent going over the ways SLS has failed to even get off the ground on time. The system is made up of older, shuttle-era parts that don't seem to be playing with the newer systems they've been hooked up to, and the new configurations that they are in. And while later designs intend to bring the SLS up to date with more modern rocket parts, it is currently an expendable Frankenstein monster of a rocket that is stubbornly refusing to cooperate with even the brightest minds at NASA. But it doesn't help that the NASA team keeps making seemingly weird and risky decisions. The first launch attempt of Artemis 1 was made before they had even done a complete wet dress rehearsal, a test that was attempted in April but had to be aborted due to leaks. And for this week's launch window, NASA saw an incoming tropical storm on a direct path to Florida and decided to let their notoriously finicky rocket just ride it out on the pad. We're not going to go into too much detail about the problems Artemis 1 has faced this year, that's been done a lot already, but like a lot of you, we were very confused as to why NASA has been taking these very uncharacteristic risks with their $4 billion moon rocket. So first off, are these decisions as risky as they seem? NASA's engineers are not only some of the best in the world, but they definitely have a better idea of what the SLS is actually made of than we do. It stands to reason that they'd know what their rocket can take. A good example of this is the storm that Artemis 1 just sat through. When you just hear that NASA let their rocket sit out in a hurricane, you could definitely be forgiven for thinking that's an insane thing for them to do. But communications with NASA Administrator Jim Free have pointed out that the winds were inside the tolerances, even if you count out the 40% margin for error on their safety limits. And, given that damage to SLS was very minimal, it seems their risky plan wasn't so dangerous after all. NASA reported in a teleconference on Sunday evening that the only damage sustained by the hurricane was superficial damage to some vulcanized filler material near the crew module adapter, which the inspectors were not worried about in the slightest, and then some more concerning damage to that notorious tail service mast and its cable system. That's one of the known leakage points on the launch tower. NASA had the damage patched quickly, and the flight directors all gave their go-ahead for launch. But even if the wind speeds were within limits, it seems odd for the notoriously careful NASA team to be so gung-ho for a launch that they'd risk more damage to Artemis 1. So it's probably more useful to think of what could make such a careful group think it was worth the risk. 
and the Artemis missions have plenty of pressure on them, so it shouldn't be too hard to think of some reasons. Given the nature of this mission, the reason for taking these sort of risks would seem to be down to the fact that Artemis 1 is a test for the rest of the program. It's meant to encounter problems and be used in ways that uncover those problems, and mission manager Mike Serafin confirmed as much during the Sunday teleconference. When asked if the team would be having different discussions about the risks and damages to SLS if it were crude, he said no, and he gave two reasons why. The first is the sort of answer you'd expect from an engineer. Mike said that in the event this mission was crewed, it would mean that NASA had already performed a test just like Artemis 1 and was successful, which implies that they had done everything right, so the discussions would be the same. Very practical answer. His second reason offers more insight into NASA's decisions with this mission, and it was that Artemis 1 is intended to give NASA the data on how this vehicle performs so they can clear a crewed mission. If they babied this rocket, if they didn't trust the structural limits and saw what happened when it leaked, then they would be in real trouble if it happened during a crewed mission. Basically, they have to treat Artemis 1 the way they would if this was a tested and reliable vehicle if they want to get accurate data. We also learn that NASA has a new solution to issues they encountered back in September with hydrogen leaking while fueling the SLS. They've chosen to do an almost 9 hour long fill routine for this launch, meaning that they will very slowly fuel the rocket at a low pressure over 9 hours, to allow for the equipment to adjust to that freezing liquid hydrogen temperature. And in a lesson learned from the April wet dress rehearsal, the inspection team now retests the bolts in all the fill cavities in case they've shaken loose during transport again. It's clear that from what Mike and the other mission heads are telling us, the whole team is unshaken by the many issues that Artemis 1 went through and is expected to go through. Launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson remarked that the team believes they are going to see more issues during the flight and in orbit and on the way to the moon. They want to get as many of them out of the way as possible. When you look at what NASA has done with Artemis 1 this past year, it's easy to get frustrated and wonder what they could be thinking. NASA is very safety conscious and very meticulous about inspections and certifications. So given that we know they're still doing loads of inspections and debating launch readiness, changing procedure, and still operating this way, the only thing we can really assume is that NASA isn't being cavalier with Artemis 1. They're being so thorough with the safety checks for Artemis 2 that they're willing to lose a $5 billion rocket. Have you heard of the sneaker company Vessi? They are today's sponsor and my favorite pair of shoes. So why are Vessi's my favorite shoes? Well, I live in Vancouver and it rains a lot. Too much, most would say. But I don't have to worry about my feet getting wet because Vessi shoes are 100% waterproof, which is perfect for the unpredictable weather of Vancouver. They are made from Dymatex, a dual climate knit material that keeps you cool in summer and warm in colder weather. It doesn't feel like it should be waterproof. They are comfortable, lightweight, and breathable. Vessi shoes have become my go-to pair of shoes to wear, but I saw that they had a new Men's City Classic that are slimmer, sleeker, and lighter than ever, so I sprung for the all-black versions, which look and feel amazing to wear. I recently got a puppy, so I'll be wearing this new pair a lot. Vessi has several styles and colors to choose from for both men, women, and kids. So if you're looking to finish your holiday shopping, get the gift that they will love and will help keep them dry and warm. Again, Vessi's are my go-to shoes sitting by my door, and they are giving away a pair of socks of your choice for the first 100 shoes sold using my code SPACERACE. And if you missed your chance to get a pair of free socks, Vessi's early Black Friday sale is on now. Get the style and size you want before they sell out at Vessi.com slash Space Race. On November 10th, the Atlas V rocket launched for the last time from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, carrying a polar orbiting weather satellite and a very interesting deorbiting prototype that's been in development at NASA for years. The prototype is widely considered as one of the most necessary pieces of tech for actual human landings on Mars an inflatable heat shield. The low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator is already back on Earth, and its test deorbit went perfectly. 
which is amazing news for the engineers that have spent over a decade developing this tech and the space industry as a whole. This prototype demonstrates technology that will be useful for way more applications than just Martian landings, but it will be particularly good at helping us land people and gear on the red planet for less cost than more rigid deorbiting systems. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. How exactly does a decelerator work? The Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator, or HIAD, actually works the same way our traditional aeroshells work, at least in principle. To land a vehicle, we need to slow it down from orbital speeds. To do this, we have to present a large enough surface area to produce atmospheric drag, which tends to produce a lot of heat as the kinetic energy of the vehicle, plus some friction from the atmosphere itself, is converted to heat energy. Currently, our rockets and capsules make use of rigid aeroshells, heat shields with hardbacks, as well as parachutes and retro rockets to deorbit. This has an upper limit to the size, because more weight means the rocket needs more fuel just to put everything into orbit. The tyranny of the rocket equation is a well-discussed topic in the industry, but really, all we need is a large surface area. So the engineers behind HIAD decided that with all the new development in material sciences, the time was ripe to try something more simple, an inflatable aeroshell. The design of this structure revolves around a stack of inflatable rings strapped together in a concentric design and layered with thermal resistant layers of synthetic fibers. The rings themselves are made of a braided synthetic fiber that are reportedly 10 times stronger than steel by weight. The rings are then protected from the heat buildup of re-entry by three layers of flexible thermal protection, starting with a ceramic fiber cloth. The strength of the fibers combined with the heat resistance of the thermal layers makes for an incredibly tough aeroshell that's shaped like a blunt cone when deployed and can withstand temperatures up to 1600 degrees Celsius. Now, the lofted test last week was able to deploy a surface of about 6 meters in diameter, making it the largest blunt body aeroshell to ever go through re-entry. The success of this type of re-entry system means that we now have the ability to pack a cheap, lightweight heat shield with a much larger surface area than we could ever achieve with the conventional rigid aeroshells. This leads to two major breakthroughs. A HIAD equipped vehicle can begin deceleration much higher up in the atmosphere, leading to less stress on the vehicle and an easier landing, as well as the ability to land things at higher altitudes. This also leads into the second breakthrough. We can land much larger objects this way. Using the huge drag surface of a HIAD shield, we can safely deorbit large rocket stages without the need for retro rockets to slow their fall. We could also think about deorbiting parts of the International Space Station when it's finally decommissioned, without just letting it burn up like Miri did. And these two breakthroughs matter even more for landing anything on Mars. The Martian atmosphere is very thin, and landings have been difficult to manage. Without a thicker atmosphere to slow them down, our drones and rovers have typically come in at very high speeds, relying on retro rockets and very tough parachutes. And that's not something that will work with the very squishy astronauts that will one day be attempting to land there. This invention will change the way we operate in space, and making cheaper, better solutions based entirely on physics is what gets most of us excited for new tech. We can't wait to see more landings. After more than 908 days in orbit, the experimental American space plane, the X-37B, finally returned home. The Boeing-built autonomous space plane launched on its current mission back in May of 2020 and has set the record for longest service mission in this program. The X-37B has been up six times so far and is a pretty reliable vehicle at this point. Like the Chinese space plane we covered last week, we don't know a great deal about the X-37B's missions as they're almost always classified military operations. The Space Force doesn't give out details on mission parameters or advanced notice of takeoffs and landings. The first we even heard of the X-37B re-entering the atmosphere was from amateur observers following up on reports of sonic booms and fireballs in the sky.
However, unlike China's mysterious space plane, we at least know what the X-37B looks like. The little plane is very similar to the earlier NASA shuttles. It's a lifting body, meaning it's made to glide back home using the shape of its belly to maintain flight. It also means that the underside is covered in black heat shield tiles as orbital deceleration is taken care of by that aero shell. And where the older shuttles were about 37 meters long, the X-37B is only 8.8 .8 meters from nose to tail. The United States Space Force owns two of these drones for testing purposes, and most of the payloads we're allowed to know about have been designed around exposing things to the space environment and seeing how they were affected. This latest mission, for instance, carried up some plant seeds for a NASA experiment on how radiation in space can affect them. There's a lot of interest in making space planes recently, especially smaller autonomous ones. Generally speaking, space planes are more easily reusable and cheaper than rockets. So in terms of testing stable systems for regular operation in low Earth orbit, space planes are a solid way to go. And the X-37B seems like a good fit for military operations in low Earth orbit. It doesn't need to have a lot of power. All it needs to do is reliably get payloads into orbit and be reusable. But it's also good to know it can operate in orbit for almost three years without majorly breaking down. That's some extreme stress testing. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.